Hi, I'm Chris Haig and this is the Fiddle Channel and today I'm going to talk to you uh, at some length about uh, how to become a professional musician. I've been doing this for a long time, uh, playing in many, many different bands, in all sorts of different styles and different situations. And when I started off in my early 20s, it looked like a, a next to impossible task to actually make a proper living. And had I been able to sit down uh, with myself <laughs> 40 years later and explain uh, how to do it, I think it would have been pretty damn useful. So I'm going to give you uh, 10 golden rules. Um, which I think might be helpful to someone who wants to actually try and make a living as a musician and maybe as a fiddle player in particular. Uh, the first thing, multiple income streams. Now when you start off, um, you do a gig, your very first gig, and you get paid and you think this is absolutely wonderful. All I need to do is do a lot of gigs and I'll get paid a lot and I can make a living. Um, but as you get further down the line, you'll see that there are more ways as a musician of making uh, a living than just from actually doing gigs. So one of them is writing, uh, writing tunes in particular. So if you're in a band um, and you're doing original material, if you're the one that's doing the writing, then the chances are that somewhere down the line you're going to start making a lot more uh, money than the rest of the band. The performing royalties are those which, which you get because it's been performed either live or on the radio or TV and the mechanical royalties are when it's put into some form such as a CD or incorporated in a TV program for example. Um, so a band which maybe gets a record deal uh, it may well be that after five years the, um, the only one that's made any money is the person that's doing the writing. So writing is great, uh, teaching is very useful. Um, you don't have to be actually very good to start teaching. I do remember my very first lesson that I gave, teaching jazz, when to be honest I knew hardly anything about jazz. Um, but I was a few steps beyond the, the player that I was teaching. So it's a pretty good idea to get into that fairly quickly. And um, it's also pretty good for learning yourself. Because until you try and teach something, you often don't understand what it is you're doing. And it was in fact my first few teaching jazz lessons that made me start thinking about what jazz actually is and how I actually do it and how other people do it. So that was pretty useful. Um, and a lot of professional musicians do a lot of teaching, either in schools or in colleges or on Zoom or in videos or various other ways. Um, sessions, recording sessions are very good. Um, this is again something that you won't get right at the start of your career, but as you get um, well known, um, people will start asking you to come and play on their records. And this is often um, quite easy, it can be quite hard. <laughs> the good thing about sessions is you never know what's coming. So most of the sessions I do, which are mostly online now, are singer-songwriters, but occasionally it's TV documentaries or uh, signed artists or whatnot, and um, it can be quite well paid, and it goes on and on, and you don't have to go outside your house nowadays. It used to be you always had to go to a studio to a session, but now most people have the equipment if they want it to, uh, to do it at home. A uh, fourth stream that I found really useful is writing library music, which is something that most people have never even heard of. But library music is the background music that appears on TV programmes, uh, budget TV programmes where they use little snippets of all sorts of things. And this is written for a music library. Um, it's music in a particular style. It's usually broken down into tiny little bits. Um, and I've done four or five albums of library music and every four months I get a royalty statement showing the um, several hundred, usually each time, different TV programmes which have used bits of my um, compositions. And um, this is usually like half a penny <laughs> for a performance, but it can be quite a, a lot more. And it adds up. And it's difficult to get into library music, but if you can, then do that. 
So there's your multiple income streams. Number two, it may sound obvious, but act professional. If you want to be professional, you've got to appear professional. Now, a lot of this is common sense, uh, like be punctual, for example. Uh, when you first start doing gigs, it's not immediately obvious. Um, you think you are a free man, you can do what you like, but if people say they want you there for a rehearsal at 6 o'clock or for a gig at 8 o'clock, then you better be there. And um, for most gigs, you've got to be smart and dressed appropriately. Um, this can be very important. Uh, I used to play in a band right at the start of my career which did working men's clubs, which are real tough places to play. And we were pretty awful, but when we started wearing matching red shirts, that made a huge difference to our professionalism, and we were respected because of those red shirts. Uh, it's important to have gear that works, to have leads that are not the cheapest you can get and are not soldered together every six weeks. Um, if you can afford to, then buy expensive gear because it lasts. Um, always carry spare strings and spare leads. Um, this may be fairly obvious, but you only have to turn up to a proper gig and you find yourself changing a string and you haven't got a string or your lead doesn't work or your amp doesn't work and people start to suspect that you're not really the guy that they want to book for the gig. It's very important to get on with people, uh, with the organisers of the gig and with the other musicians in the band. Uh, in your first band, chances are they'll all be your friends, so this is not a problem, but as you get down the line, you'll often be working with people who are in the same band with, with you because they are good musicians and not because they are mates. And it's important to get on with them, whether you like them or not, and <laughs> whether they like you or not. And uh, some awareness of band politics is pretty important. So a band often has a leader, it may have a chain of command, and you may well be at the bottom. And it is well to understand that and not to start demanding things when you're in no position to do so. Uh, number three, find yourself a mentor. Now here, this is a really good one. Uh, when I first moved down to London, um, I met a few jazz fiddle players and one of them said to me, you should go for lessons for, from Johnny Van Derrick. He was an old guy who'd been around a long time. He'd done a lot of jazz gigs, did a lot of sessions and so forth. And he said to me, uh, go for lessons to him and it will help your career a lot. And so I did. And Johnny, bless him, he wasn't actually the best of teachers, but he was a really good guy to know. And I showed him that I was really keen, that I was hardworking, that I wanted to learn and that I could play. And he very soon started giving me gigs. Uh, so the stuff he didn't want to do or was double booked for, he would pass those gigs on to me. And if you can find someone in that situation, preferably in your local town or city, someone who's several steps up the ladder from you, someone who probably has more gigs than they can manage, then do get in with that person and you'll find it really useful. I have a friend uh, who's a bass player and uh, he carried this to an absolute, uh, to the max. Um, he met <laughs> one of the top bass players on the British folk and jazz scene and uh, in no time they were best friends and uh, he was getting gigs from him for decades after that. So get yourself a mentor, that's a really good piece of uh, advice. Number four, do your homework. When someone says these are the numbers we're going to be doing at the gig, then um, the gig may be only a couple of days away but spend as much time as you can preparing those numbers if you've never seen them before. Uh, I, if, if at all possible, I write everything out. Uh, which may be appropriate to use on the gig or it may not, but doing that preparation is really useful. Whenever I get a, a recording session where I, I get the music in advance, I always write out the, the chord sheet and any ideas for melodies that I have, and so that I can turn up and, wherever possible, do a first take, which is as good as, as everything else. So always turn up with um, everything ready. And in the long term, doing your homework means mastering a style. And for a fiddle player, this is really important. Um, because there are so many styles to learn. And I decided uh, way at the beginning of my career that <laughs> I was going to learn every style. And uh, it's taken a long time, but I've got a long way with a lot of those styles. And uh, so when someone says, we're doing a bluegrass gig, or we've got a French gig, or we're doing a uh, Swedish gig, then I've got a repertoire and I've got some idea of the style and I can turn up uh, at least pretending to know what I'm doing. Next one, uh, think long term. 
When you start out, you may be only thinking about the next couple of gigs, but um, I was determined from the beginning that I was going to be a full-time musician for as long as it lasted. And uh, this is partly because I came from an actual school teaching career uh, for two years. <laughs> and I was so desperate to get out of that, that uh, I really did want to be a professional musician. Um, thinking long term means thinking ahead. So um, mastering the styles, as I just said, is a pretty important thing. Jumping at opportunities is a great one. Um, so, for example, I turned up at a, a very cheap bluegrass gig which a friend of mine had organised and uh, it was in an office and um, I wasn't really looking forward to the gig. It was in the middle of the afternoon and I would rather have been at home. But in the interval I looked around the office and I saw that the walls were lined with music books. These were music publishers and they had a series called the, um, the bass handbook, the piano handbook, the guitar handbook, were really successful books and uh, a, a light bulb went off in my head. So I located the boss of the company, I said, I don't suppose you'd be interested in a fiddle handbook. And lo and behold, he said, yes, actually we would. <laughs> and uh, I'd done my homework previously because I had a website which was stuffed full of information about different fiddle styles. So I said, uh, check out my website. And he did, and that was the start of my uh, long and illustrious uh, book writing career. So I was ready for that opportunity and I, and I saw it and I took it. Um, another one is passing on gigs. No. Often the band isn't always working with the original members and you're going to want depths, people who are going to fill in. And if someone rings you and says, can you do a gig on the so-and-so and you can't, don't say, no, I'm afraid I can't. What you should say is, uh, no, I can't, but I think I may know someone who can. Now, if this is a well-paid gig, you think, okay, who is the up the chain that I would like to impress. So if I ring so-and-so and say, uh, would you be interested in a gig for 200 quid at the so-and-so, then even though it's not my gig and I'm not doing it, he will be impressed that you've got a gig to offer. And he may well remember your name as someone you, who, who may be able to debt for him in the future. So uh, think about who you're going to pass on a gig to. And uh, cultivating depth is really useful because in your own band, Let's say you're a four-piece band and you can make most of the gigs but you can't make one or two. It's important that you have someone that you can ring and actually get them to fill in for you. This will enable you to stay in a band a lot longer because you're not turning down gigs all the time or you're not leaving a space or leaving someone else with the trouble of sorting out your place. So knowing a lot of other fiddle players or whatever your instrument is, is really useful. And contact in general are something you should really hang on to. Whether it's other band leaders, other types of musician, other fiddle players, um, organisers, remember those names, write those names down and uh, whenever possible remind those people that you still exist. Also part of thinking long term is the uh, other skills that go into a professional musician's life such as um, artwork, being able to do your own posters, uh, computer skills, being able to make your own website, um, technical skills for recording or um, turning mp3s into ifs of, of whatnot and uh, doing your own demos and sending them off all this is stuff that's not obvious and um, once you can do them it makes your life a lot easier <laughs>
Um, but having that, that repertoire has been pretty useful. Having those tunes all written out is pretty useful. Uh, if you do, let's say, pre preparation for a, a one-off gig, then the work you put into that may well be useful for something else. If you learn to do a to make your own poster, then that's going to be useful for other stuff. If you do an album, um, I, I've only done one solo album, uh, which wasn't a big success, but the having tunes on there which are in a lot of different styles has been very useful in the long term, not because I've sold loads of copies, but because I'm able to use those as demos for a, a various different styles that I play. Um, and I'm able to use those as backing uh, in at the end of quite a lot of my videos, for example. Um, some of those are pretty obscure tunes, but having them has been useful, uh, despite the fact that, as I say, I haven't sold loads of copies. Next one, promote yourself. Uh, one of my first things that I discovered, uh, I joined a band with a Russian guy and he made these publicity postcards with uh, a photo of the band on the front and he sent them off to loads of agents and I thought that's a great idea, I'm going to do that. So I did, I got myself an expensive photo, I wrote some blurb on the back and I looked through uh, lists of agents and sent them to around 100 agents and some of the contacts I got from that gave me gigs for years uh, after that. So that's the way people used to do it. Uh, nowadays, having lots of stuff on YouTube is good. Um, rejecting the stuff that's not very good, or getting rid of it from YouTube is a good idea. Uh, so only have good stuff on there. Make sure you have some good photos of yourself and make sure that you have a personal website and a Facebook on, or whatever is uh, appropriate for the time. Because if someone says to someone else, you want to try this Chris Haig, and uh, they don't know anything else about him, they're going to Google that musician and you want to find the, all the information there and you want to be able to find uh, what the person looks like, what they sound like, as well as what their address is and so forth. So make sure all that information is readily available and that it looks good. Promoting yourself also uh, comes back to the other things like getting on with people, uh, being able to represent yourself well to other people, saying, I can do that, I will do that. <laughs> Uh, next one, learn to be a band leader. When you start off, chances are you'll be called in to join some other people. And um, you'll find that the, the band leader has probably doing, been doing this for a long time, whereas your career within that band might be pretty short, depending on how good you are or not very good you are. Um, and there are various things that go into being a band leader. Um, one is having a PA, having your own PA, because that makes a big difference. Um, having the repertoire, so not just playing either what's put in front of you or what you're told to memorise. If you have a pad full of music um, which covers the repertoire of that particular style, often, I, I, I used to say, the pad is the gig. So I've got pads, each pad being like an inch thick um, for every style you can imagine. So I've got a French pad, I've got a Latin pad, I've got a German pad, I've got a Swedish pad, a Norwegian pad. And I can then turn up, if an agent rings me up and says, um, can you do a Norwegian gig? I'll say, of course I can. And I can then present that music in front of a, a bunch of other guys or gals who don't actually know anything about Norwegian music, but I've got the chords written out and we can have a decent stab at it. And um, th that's pretty damn useful. Learning to be able to introduce is very useful. Um, so the person who explains what the next song is about and can tell a few jokes about it, can have a, a witty little story to go with it. That is a really valuable thing, which I've been cultivating uh, since my early days. Even though I'm not much of a talker in, um, in real life, as my friends will know, um, being able to talk to an audience is a really useful thing. Number nine, uh, learn a second instrument and or sing. Um, if you look at the, the careers of rock violinists, for example, Eddie Jobson, uh, English violinist, was probably the most successful. He played in all sorts of bands. And one of the reasons he was so successful was that he was not only a violinist, but a great keyboard player. And a lot of bands really liked the idea of the violinist, but um, in most rock bands, for example, there isn't a place for violin in every number, whereas keyboards rarely do fit in. I never learned keyboards beyond a uh, three-finger level, but had I been able to do so, it would have been very helpful. 
Uh, I do play guitar and mandolin, and the guitar has been really useful for, uh, for songwriting. Uh, the mandolin is a useful little filler. Um, keys would have been really useful. And learning to sing, not only does that help with um, improving the vocals of a band, it also really makes your life more interesting. I do remember uh, for about three years I used to have a terrible gig, uh, a duo gig, which was a two and a half hour set uh, finishing at uh, I think one o'clock in the morning doing covers uh, and not very well. And um, after only about three of these gigs my mind was wandering and I was looking at my watch which is a terrible thing to do and I thought Either I'm going to drift away, I'm going to die on stage, or uh, I'm going to have to do some different way of approaching this gig. Because for me, this gig was just too easy. And by starting to sing just a little bit of the choruses to start with, it really improved my involvement with the, with the music. And uh, I found, in general, playing in covers bands in particular, where it's not the most exciting stuff, being able to sing just makes you more part of the band and stops you from <laughs> drifting away into space. Um, finally, uh, life is not a bowl of cherries for a musician. Um, it's, it's a really good career, but it is fraught with dangers. Um, it's a calling, but it's also a job, and you've got to understand that the world doesn't owe you a living. So don't expect that every gig is going to be great, that every band that you play with is going to be great, that you're going to have success with everything. So for me, this has involved um, taking all sorts of gigs and playing in all sorts of bands. So uh, in my younger days, I would probably have been in eight or ten bands at a time. Uh, some of which I really enjoyed, some of which I was doing for money. And in the long term, it's a good idea to mix those gigs together. Mix together the art gigs that you do for love with the money gigs that you do to help you make a living and don't expect that all of them are going to be the ones that you want. So it can be quite a difficult job juggling different bands, but it's very important and worthwhile to be able to do so, and having a lot of depths will help this a lot. Um, looking in the long term, there are kind of three stages to a career, and the first stage is in some ways the easiest, even though it's, the, it's where you're struggling most and it's most difficult to make a living. But uh, when, when you're just starting out, you can basically do what you want with who you want and uh, you don't have the responsibility of uh, making it pay. And um, for example, with me, it was the Speedy Bears, my prog rock band, and we had a great time, but we really had in the long term no chance of success because this was uh, 1976 and punk was just coming to its height and prog rock was not the thing. Um, but at that time it didn't matter because I had no responsibilities. Um, if you want to go and play at a festival for next to no money, then that doesn't matter. All your friends are going to be really into it. It's going to be great fun. The difficult part of your career comes when you have a husband or a wife, and you have a mortgage, and you have kids, and then it gets to be really tough, especially if your partner is not a musician. So if they're sitting at home looking after the kids, and you're going off having a great time, and playing at a festival and coming back um, with a hangover and next to no money and your partner says uh, so what was it like and you have to say it was really hard work um, do not let on that you had a great time <laughs> under any circumstances and this will this will manage for you for a while but in the long term you're going to have to actually start coming home with some proper money and that's when you're going to have to start turning down those festivals where you made no money and you're going to have to actually make some kind of a living. And for those 10 or 15 years, your career is going to be really difficult. And this is when a lot of people actually give up and get a proper job. Uh, when your kids are grown up and your mortgage is paid off, then hurrah, you can start going back to the gigs you love. And it's not so important and to, to make uh, lots of money on every gig. And also, it's easy to get the gigs because a lot of people know you and people ring up and offer you gigs. So the third part of your career, which is what I am currently enjoying, is actually something really to look forward to. I'm just going to finish off with two little stories uh, which show the fact that um, gigs are a mixture of the good and the bad, and you've got to take every, everything for what it is. So I had a gig uh, about six years ago, and it was with a, a rock star. 
It was uh, a really exciting gig. It was in Dubai. It was on a big stage, big PA, big audience, playing numbers uh, that I'd heard on Top of the Pops as a kid. And I was really excited about this gig. The trouble was that the rock star in question um, acted reprehensibly on this gig. It was embarrassing to be in the place with him and it really ruined the gig for me and I never wanted to work with him again and fortunately I haven't. <laughs> um, so uh, that it should have been a great gig and it wasn't. And then uh, there's a, there was another gig that I did and it was in a really narrow room and it was really noisy and the PA was terrible and the audience really weren't listening. And what's more, this narrow little room was shaking up and down and side to side. And it was difficult to stand up sometimes. Um, but it was actually a fabulous gig because that gig was at a private party on the Orient Express going from Paris to Venice. And uh, fortunately the only murder that night was uh, some of the jazz numbers that we did. <laughs> So, so I hope this has been of some use. Um, if you're listening, uh, Chris Haig from 30 years ago, then please pay attention and your life will be a lot easier. See you again soon.